so annoying. Okay, we're going to take a look at a video about data flow diagrams. And let's see if the microphone, it's hard to tell which microphone it's being used. Is this the microphone? Can't tell now. I'm seeing sound. I'm sure that makes good sound in the microphone. All right, let's see what they have to say to us here about data flow diagrams. Have you seen him before? Hello, I'm Tom Hathaway. I'm wearing my BA hat, so let's talk business analysis. This nugget is about data flow diagrams. We are going to discuss what a data flow diagram is, what symbols you can use on a data flow diagram, and what purpose it serves. These techniques will help you when you are the one wearing the BA hat. A picture really is worth a thousand words, especially in the world of business analysis for IT projects. Try to describe workflows or business processes in natural language and the chances that IT will deliver the solution you want are very small indeed. The challenge is what picture do you need to draw? There are several techniques for drawing business process models or diagrams and each has a specific focus. Data flow diagrams, DFDs, represent the workflow or steps within a business process with a focus on the flow and transformation of business data. A DFD is the right choice for business process modeling if you need to understand the creation and consumption of data in the individual business processes. Recognize all the parts here. External entities. Now this could be a person or a, another, process, another system, credit card processor. Here's your processes. They sell the product, taking the final order. Well, there could be a lot going on inside of sell product. Item price is a is an internal process. Notice it has no external entity communicating with it. It's just getting information from other processes. And you've got data stores. Do you see any problems with our diagram? Is this a complete diagram? Any errors here? Remember the things we check for? Which one? This one? It does have some coming up. Yep. Takes, it's taking in tax rates, item prices, shipping costs, and then a total. A completed order comes to the check item price, compares the prices to the IDs in the data store of orders, has input and outputs. This one has input and output, so no black holes, inputs and outputs to this. There's a couple possible questions here. What's the possible problem with these two data stores? It's not a complete drawing because we're not showing what wrote the information. Now tax rates, they may be some static information that was entered at the start. And you could put you know a little a little process saying, you know, from tax tables of the US government build my tax tables. Some tables, they are essentially static information, but it's useful to mention when you're doing a data flow diagram. If you want to be pure data flow diagram, you might follow that rule meticulously and show that process. But as I, as I was reading from one guy is, don't be a slave of the, of the diagram. Be careful of those rules, but the whole idea is to provide useful information to the people programming your system. If everyone knows, hey, the tax tables, they're there and they never change, don't 
worry that okay it's only being read from well when we when we update our system we get the tax table and that's stored in a database that's what's meaningful to us as programmers we don't have to be all uptight about well you know we've got a spontaneous generation here we can't do this but those but knowing the rules about data flows you, it'd be a little trigger okay is there something we're missing how does that information get in there oh that's generally from the government table. Same thing here. There's going to be an update in inventory database process somewhere. And in this specific discussion, we're not worried about that, so we don't show it on our diagram. That's okay. And if you want to be uh, clear about it, you might put maybe in a dotted line, update inventory process is out here. But if you're just talking about when you're processing, taking it and uh, processing orders, you don't have to worry that, oh, we're not showing everything in here and this is another spontaneous generation. Generally, this is the data store associated mostly with taking and processing orders. And we see, yeah, that we probably want to be complete in how this data store gets filled and who reads it. Otherwise, you're putting in things in or reading things out of data stores. You don't know where the actual information came from. So this is a good, I like reviewing other people's data stores. Does that make sense to you to think, okay, what code would I put in each little box? And I'm thinking uh, with your little Java coding, we could maybe write a small little program and maybe describe it briefly with the data flow. One guy doesn't even recommend even using a drawing program. He's saying use this process when you're t standing at the whiteboard talking with your with your programmers. Use this technique but don't be a slave to it and erase it because the real code may not exactly match it. This is getting ideas on the table in a common diagramming technique. So some people go from hey just use it as a way to describe others be very careful document your system this way. And remember the trouble with that is eventually your code may not match your data flow diagram. If you really want to be pure, you're going to have someone's job to come back and update your data flow diagrams to make sure they exactly match the code. Why, when would that be important? To have these diagrams exactly match the code. Yeah, yeah. It's, you could use it for a marketing thing. It's showing that, hey, you're doing your homework. We have a system here. Also, training in new people to your project. If you have good data flow diagrams showing, hey, here's how our system works, they can get up to speed with you know, a, a big picture of what's going on and then say, okay, now my job is to write the code for this part. Oh, I know how it fits with everything. And when someone mentions, oh, the orders table, oh, I, I have an idea how that fits. The depicted process can be manual or automated it does not matter as far as the diagram is concerned. Every business process is a more or less complex sequence of steps that changes something coming in to create something new. As such, it needs input, which could be information or any other resource. It uses the input to create output whether the output is something altogether new or simply an altered version of the original input. Using the input to create the output adds some measurable value to the process. Thus we often refer to the value chain of the organization. Fundamentally, any diagram is simply a picture with constraints. In the case of the DFD, the constraints are which symbols you can use and what each symbol means. There are really only two widely used conventions and the differences are minimal. Both allow only four basic symbols. A rounded rectangle represents a process at some level of detail that has to have a name. The name consists of an active verb, what is done, and a direct object, what it is done to, i.e process credit card, sell product, check item price. As you can see from the examples, the named process can be at any level of detail, from the very large, sell product, to the minute, check item price. 
An arrow represents a data flow, meaning information in motion. Because the data is going from somewhere to somewhere, the arrow points in the direction of movement. Every data flow has to have a name. Because it is data and data is a thing, the name is a noun with appropriate modifiers, i.e. credit card authorization, invoice, item number. As with the process, the name data flow can be at any level of detail. A special symbol consisting of a small square with the top and bottom lines extending outward to the right represents a data store. A data store is simply data at rest. It is not going anywhere. It is simply waiting to be consumed by some process. A data store is not necessarily a file, although a file is a data store. Like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not necessarily a square. A simple square with or without an optional shadow, represents an external entity. In the world of data flow diagramming, an external entity represents a person, organization, or application that is out of scope from the perspective of the DFD, or the project. Specifically, it implies that the represented object is not going to be analyzed or impacted by any project using this diagram, but the interface to the object has to be analyzed. The data flow diagram shows a business process at some indeterminate level of detail. As indicated above, some of the processes might be very global, whereas others are very specific. If you need to understand how a process works in detail, you can explode it to see its internal processes. Notice here, he's not showing the little numbers that they have on processes in the book. It's kind of helping you keep track of when you've exploded something, what is it a part of? So if this were 1, these would be 1.1, 1.2. Numbering them and then having individual helps you make the connections. I haven't seen that, and I don't think Visio has a little box for putting the numbers. It just has one big title. You can always add that as your first line for your name of your box. Because the DFD does not differentiate levels of detail, these sub-processes are simply processes that are at a lower level of detail. And see how the lines coming in and out of that exploded should match the lines coming in and out of the box here. So I see one out, two in, that should match this. Uh, and we're assuming he has a PMO showing up here. And actually showing how it's showing the data is coming into multiple places in our exploded, so that represents that arrow. He's not showing this arrow on this exploded. It should be probably up here coming into one of these processes. Each of these internal processes creates and consumes specific data. If you draw a data flow diagram at this more detailed level, you will see internal data flows and data stores that are more specific and detailed as well. Any process at any level of detail is a potential candidate for exploding. The only factor to consider is whether you understand the process sufficiently to predict how change will affect it. Or how to write a DFD the code serves multiple purposes. Spot. You might create one to be able to analyze the current situation with the goal of identifying roadblocks and improving efficiency. You might also create one to present and discuss the process with others. You could create a DFD of a proposed business process before you develop detailed processes and supporting IT applications to identify potential issues before they occur. Its principal use is presumably to identify, document, and communicate stakeholder requirements for an IT project. Fundamentally, there are two good reasons why you need a diagram. First off, people can point to the diagram to discuss a process or flow instead of using words to describe what they mean. The diagram represents a visual mode of communication, which all studies show is much more effective than mere words. Pointing power proves that it works. Correct. Secondly, studying the diagram generates questions that might indicate missing steps or external entities. If the diagram piques your curiosity, 
it is well worth your while to investigate the situation to find an answer. That is another huge advantage of the model over textual explanations. It forces you to ask the important questions. You do not know until you get the answer whether or not that something is relevant to your project. Missing processes, data components, and stakeholders during the early phases of a project are major contributors to project failures. A simple, well-constructed DFD helps you avoid these pitfalls. Doesn't guarantee it though. If you've done it right and you've done the proper meeting uh, discussion, that's the key thing is the people that are the stakeholders, if they have a handle on what's on what you're doing, then you're in good shape. So back to our course then here. Let's find our course and look at our project here. I'm hoping to work on the data flow diagram for our chapter work here. So come on over here and see how we're doing on our schedule, our plan schedule here. Today is the 24th. Finish up our data flow diagram. Finish up any activities in chapter 4. Uh, at the end of the chapter, you get to pick two of those activities. Uh, are there any particular activities at the end of the chapter that you're liking? Hannah, what ones do you like? Flashcards. Okay, you like the crossword, huh? Yeah. And remember that the you I, with the Java one, you can fill in guesses and let it check to see if you got the right guess. Uh, how about you, Micah? Like those? And remember, you can you're welcome to work on things together if you can't get an answer. It's more about helping to review the problem. Don't if you're stumped on something, uh, don't feel guilty if you go ask someone, hey, what'd you get on that? Because that's just kind of a way to review the chapter material. We want to get a data flow diagram for our Tim's system. So let's go back to I'm gonna use Visio today and the data flow. And I had Visio over here somewhere. Here we go. And here I found the Visio process uh, gain source. And did you all find that underneath more shapes? It was software and database, uh, software, data flow diagram, gain sarsen. So I can turn off data flow diagrams and just turn on gain sarsen. Those are the only four I need. You're welcome to try using the others and just see what they offer you in additional diagrams, explore those. But yeah, I just started with a blank one, yeah. And then you go to, uh, in the stencil, go to more shapes, software database, software, gain sarsen. Even though data flow diagrams, I went here first and thought, hey, where, I can't find it. And then I realized they had specifically put the gain sarsen those four in a special little place in their list. I've seen other software, and just before we get into this, uh, I looked at a program called DIA, DIA, or short for Diagram. That's an open source. It's a little clunkier looking than Visio, but it will do uh, much of the same, and it has the gain sarsen. It has the additional, I think, the name across the top, like it shows in the book, where Visio doesn't have that. So let's see what we could do for a data flow for the TIMS system. So let's zoom in here. Can I adjust some things? I can't adjust some things. I can get rid of that, I guess. Since I have four shapes, I can just copy paste them. And the control row of the mouse doesn't work. Oh, there it does. So here's my process. First of all, let's just lay out our context zero diagram for the TIM system, which we sort of have done. But let's uh, put some of these. Oh, I have the drawings over here. I can always just click and drag them in when I want to use them. So in our main process, this would be our context diagram. So for my title, I'll put uh, zero and then TIMS. 
And let's see, can I adjust the font independently? Let's try that. Yeah, I can I can adjust the title independently of the number of my crop. And you can play with your styles however you like. If you have a particular preference of style, go with it. I'm not going to be fussy as long as it's professional looking. Be creative. So this would be, and don't forget to put a title. Let's put in a nice little title over here. Uh, where's my text box? So this would be Tim's context diagram. And if you want to be MLA-like, you could put CS412, spring, 15, and then your name. Enlarge that. And I can do my regular alignment thing, so the Microsoft look and feel of my menus. There's our Tim system. And when I'm done, hit enter. Oh. And I guess I have to turn off text. Turn go back to my pointer tool. Can I Adobe like changing my pointer? And I can zoom out just a bit here, see how it fits on the page. Is it doing yeah, it's doing landscape format, which is the default. I like that. I'm going to shrink my ribbon to give me more graphical room here. And now I can adjust the size of the thing. First thing I want to think about is what are my external entities? At context level zero, I don't need to worry about data store, so I'm going to delete that data store. That's just worthless. What are my external entities that interact with my TIM system? Yeah, let's go do that. We'll start with that. Students. And I'll put one student at a time. Instructor. Well, I don't have a database in there. Well, we'll be using that. We're going to treat our database as a data store within the within the data pool in here. So yeah, there will be database tape, and I'll probably I'll have one database, and the data stores I'm thinking will be tables within that database. Now your software designers may say, you know, we want to have have a different database for this data, and not simply a different table in a database. That's left to be uh, decided by the programmers in uh, of the system. All we care about is that we keep that data somewhere. And if we describe it as a data store in very generic terms, here's the data we store somewhere, and we give it a name, the programs can come along and say, yeah, that, that's represented by this database over here, or they could say by this table over here. So that, yeah, there, there will be a database, but we're going to treat it as simply a data store. That's my plan. If we realize it's complex enough, we may have an external entity that we just call it the storage system, and we provide it data. So that might be like a backup system. That could be an external entity. All right, so we have student instructors, and we can think about the data now. What, and at the, at the context level zero, the data is very generic term. So let's see if I can make this connect here. It turns green, it's connected. And can I give that a name? What should we give the name of the data flowing into the system from the student? Remember, data should be generally a noun. But at this level, it can be very broad, abstract term. Yeah, they could be you know, pre, you know, submitting homework material. They're logging in, giving their login name. Uh, they're updating their passwords. 
they're doing all sorts of data interaction with our system. So it's kind of hard at this level to say, you know, what is that data? So we could put some very broad term of, how about profile? Profile and work. So we can say they're entering their login and they're providing, they're uploading work, uh, completed assignments. And let's see if I can make the size of that text a little bigger. I don't want to make it too big or it kind of falls off the data line, but uh, there's how Visio nicely labels my data line. Unlike PowerPoint where I have to manually group things and they go crazy when I move things around. Let's see what happens if I move this. See how Visio keeps the connection. This is a nice thing as I organize things. Now there will be data going out to the students. So let's draw the connector now going to the student from our system. What would we call the data going out to the student? And as you move things around, Visio will may flow the line differently. Uh, let's try it. Yeah, I think I just just happened to drag it to it. And if you have a second line, it doesn't want to. Oh, look at it, it just stayed there. So I disconnect it, click, and it just turns green and connects to the middle of mine. So the question now is what do we label that data going out to the student? And it's looking like my recording levels are low. Is there a way for me to adjust my recording level? Yep. And so what term will we call that? Well that would be an that would be we need to describe the data. Again, it can be a very generic term. Could be, well, just think of what, what is reported to the students. Their welcome screens, their transcripts, their grades, uh, their homework schedule. At this level, very generic, we could call it uh, Assignments and transcripts, schedule and transcripts, how about course information, very general. And increase the size just a little bit. Now for the instructor. Now we have to think about what data does the instructor provide. And we can think of the instructor dealing with classes and grading of projects, but also the instructor providing materials in the course. So he provides course design and as they're running the, uh, managing the class, assignment assessment. Ooh, that's a good word, use assessment. So. From the system, let's do that line. The instructor gets his schedule and roster of students. So we could give it a more abstract term of course enrollment. Enrollment, right? And content. Increase the size a bit. Now it's irritating me that it's overlapping over that other data line, but we'll just go with the way Visio, and if I adjust things, I can avoid that overlap. 
and I'm not going to be fussy if it doesn't look perfect. Generally, we'll let Visio try to, we'll just kind of see how Visio does it. And this, this shows that I, let's see, can I, can I force a line feed in my title here? Let's try. Let's try line feed. Yeah, I can I can make double lines on my data title. Now, what does the instructor provide to the system? I'll draw that connector. And it can kind of be going this, it can be similar. Oh, look at that, it doesn't like to go to the center. And I'm not sure how it's deciding where to put it on the box. I'll just let it, I'll just let Visio decide. And Teacher puts course content. Actually, content is something that uh, maybe instead of content here, what I meant is the student's assignment. So maybe I'll put a completed work or something. How about completed? Uh, I'll put results. Here I'll put the instructor designs course, course design. And the instructor also grades things. So enter and how about assessment? Course design and assessment while he's conducting the course. So the instructor has to actually deal with content in the course. That's called that's the course design part. But then while he's running it, students are taking performing work, completing assignments, then the instructor's assessment. And of course, there's there's a lot more things that go on in there. If it's a good system, the instructor will be interacting with students through some kind of uh, forums or dialogue and instructions and feedback in the grades. Well, that's all implied when we're talking about interaction. We could have a whole very generic term called interaction, but that's doesn't name the data very well. It's more of a verb. All right, now I'm thinking of at least two more entities. Yeah, yeah. So we'll put administrator. I'll make admin for short so I can get it nice readable in my box. I'm not going to be fussy of how you exactly name it as long as it's recognizable. And a connector for administration. Data coming in from administration to our system. Setup, configuration, uh, course categories. That all falls under, I might just call it System, how about system configuration? And the at this level, the admin isn't getting a lot out of the system, but it is giving getting some kind of data back. And how about we call that well, let's see, it'll confirm that it's set up. It'll get status reports. How about we just get uh, status data back to admin? Gets reports, gets error messages. So static is a, status is a very generic term. Generally, I don't want to mix my font size. It'd be nice to make all my data lines the same font size. And I think I can control select. Let's see, can I shift select multiple things and adjust the font size? Fourteen point. Looks like I might be able to control my font all at once. I'm gonna run this, at least on all the data lines. Uh, I think in the oh, well, there's a style somewhere you can adjust the style. Uh, maybe it's over there. Is there a font size? I don't know if I can, yeah, looks like I can set my font size. Let's try it. See, I found my default 14. If I click apply, 
I don't know if it'll remember that as the default. Let's try it. If I make something here. So now we have a min. How about Remember another another entity this our Tim system needs to interact with? Remember our accounting system has to report accounting. So we'll just put accounting. It's not the accountant, it's actually a system, but it's we treat that as an entity. Remember that little uh, video talked about that's something that's out of our scope. We don't worry about what happens there. We just worry about what we get from it, what we send to it. Coming out of Tim's. Now what data title would you give to what it provides to the accounting system. Because accounting is going to be charging the students. So that it needs to know active students, uh, are they enrolled this semester, what courses they're taking, how many credits they're taking, their GPA might affect their financial aid. So a lot of information, we could call it, I suppose one very generic term we could call it information, but that's maybe, we might just say, how about uh, student information, uh, student financial records, financial information. So let's just, how about, uh, yeah, there you go, student finance. Student financial status. Yeah, we're we paying the instructors. That's right. So reporting what instructors are teaching what, what hours they have. So we could call it user financial status instead of instead of just strictly students. So that would include teachers and how many hours they're putting in, how many classes they're teaching, how many co students they have. Maybe they're getting paid on per student. That would be nice. So you have an incentive to get students to enroll. Here we're here at Mass. We're generally paid by student, but it's just the whole effect of the what's our year's budget based on our student enrollment. Now the accounting provides back to the Tim system. I don't know if it needs a whole lot from the Tims. I mean from the accounting. Uh, Maybe we'd have to expel a student because they haven't paid their bill. We'd put a freeze on seeing whether they can see their grade because they haven't paid a bill. There's all sorts of things. So it could be just, again, similar thing. Uh, what, what could we call it? Controls, uh, restrictions, uh, valid account. Account information sounds a little little broad. Payroll, you know, how much they get paid, how much they owe. Bill, how about billing? Let's call it billing. Did you find a better word than that? Billing. Accounts receivable, that's more of a noun than, a, than data. So there's our context level zero. You notice we're not showing any data folds, we're just saying our system interacts in this way with these particular entities that come to mind as we think about how our system functions. Now I think in this case study, they want us now to break down a sub-process 
in our tune system. Build our Wait a minute, do we put a zero here? Is this context zero? I don't remember now. If this if at this level whether we put a zero there. There's a context and then there's a context zero. Now I'm not mixed up. Let's take a look at my book here. There's a, di there's a diagram zero, and then there's a context. Yeah, they show the zero in the in the context diagram. Diagram zero kind of explodes the context zero. So we do have we do put a zero there in the context diagram, and then in the uh, diagram zero, the first level of detail of our system, we start laying out sub processes major processes within our TIM system. And looking at our assignments here, let's take a look. We want to create our case study here. They want a context diagram and a diagram zero. So we've done this now. We've done the context diagram. Now, diagram zero is naming a few major processes. In the book's example, the one on page 208, it has four internal processes they've identified at diagram level zero. So now it's our chance to now make our diagram level zero. We'll use this same, these same uh, uh, items. I'm going to copy. And can I insert a new page? New page. And then I paste that. Does it create a new page if you just copy paste? Uh, landscape or, let's see, I would guess file. Is it under file setup? Design, design, orientation. <clears throat> so here's my second page, and this will be now, I'm going to put a title. And I'll make a text. This will be my diagram zero, Tim's diagram zero. Tim's diagram zero. So I'm going to basically break this box up into sub-processes. So I'm going to, oh, what happened to my cursor? Oh, I see. So it's got like little tabs for the pages. Okay. Like, or like Excel-like. Okay, I get it. Okay, so my page two, hey, can I name that? Yeah, I'm going to name that one. Diagram 0. I'm going to rename that one to Context. Okay, so Diagram 0. This is going away, but I'm going to keep these data lines, and I might be adding more detail to the data lines, but let me go to my, got to turn on my pointer tool, and I'm going to delete this box, but leave everything else there. And now I'll replace what was in that box. I'm going to pull my entities out to leave room for naming sub-processes. And we'll, just, we'll align them nicely around the outer corners. Now, what kind of processes will be included inside our TIM system? And they give you some hints at similar thing on chapter, uh, on page 208 in chapter 5. They have a grading system, strictly a grading system. 
but some of those processes are involved in ours. We may have, we may be a level up from our grading system. Yeah, we could have a process called grading system that it takes student and instructor information and uh, assigns grades. So let's go ahead and do something like that. We'll put a grading system process within here. So I'm going to bring in a process. You know, I don't really like just the solid blue. I might come back and change my design. So we'll call this uh, grading. So we want to give it a process number, sub-process number, and so I'm going to call it 1, and then I'm going to put grading. And I might call it grading process. And I can adjust my shape there to give me room. And what data does it get in to it? Well, think of what happens when I'm grading. I have to find their assignments. So let's make a data store of submitted assignments. So this is where now we involve a data store. And we'll call this uh, completed work, submitted work, uploaded. The educational term, I think they call it artifacts. But uh, should we call this completed work? Student, yeah, completed work. So there's a data store holding their completed work, and where did the title go? Try that again. Completed work. Enter, and click off of it, and my title goes away. Strange. Did I make it too? It's crazy. Completed work. Enter. What else do I have to do here to make it stick? Oh. <laughs> okay, let's make sure. Yeah, look at that. You default. There we go. Oh, so I suppose if I'd chosen a different style for my data flow, see what styles I can apply, quick style to my data flow. Ah, it doesn't doesn't have an, a style, even though I apply a style, it doesn't it won't it refuses to be colored on the inside. Alright, so there's there's my data star. Alright. We'll do that, and we'll say, well, can we draw a line from our data to our completed work data flow data store? Uh, illegal. You can't go directly from an entity to a data store. So the student provides the work. So the data store, the grading process, takes the student's work. And we may break this profile and work into multiple pieces of data. So I think I'll call this just... Uh, work instead of profile because that will go to maybe the, the login part so this, the grading process takes the student work it's when we, since we're grading we're assuming it's been complete so we're ignoring the submit the the uh, work part but we are reading from the data store work they've completed Now the instructor has to provide a grade, right? Has to view the view the uh, completed assignment. So let's have that data going from here to completed assignment or uh, submitted work. Student student views that, or the teacher views that, and then assigns a grade. Yeah, 
because the instructor has to see the assignment and then the instructor assigns a grade and then we're going to have to rearrange our boxes so we don't have so many lines crossing each other and the, the teacher assigns a grade um, so we could call it assigned grade And now let's move boxes around so we don't have too many things crossing. We may be deleting some some lines. Oh, it's getting pretty ugly here. Maybe I'll get rid of this coursement enrollment and results uh, for now. Because this is part of the results. Students submitted the assignment. Course information, I'll get rid of that for now zoom out a little bit. Less confusing lines at this point, but we're going to be adding more confusing lines. And we can move this process around if we think it fits better. Generally closest to the entities avoids the number of crossing lines. And can I adjust it? My data store. Let's see, do I have an extra and I have an extra carriage return there? Yeah. Uh, depending how much detail we see there, if we see, you know, that's that's simple enough. I know what happens with that one, but then you, then you can go into detail in that, where uh, you're actually looking at quizzes, essays. They may get treated differently, like forums. How do you grade a forum? That's a whole different way of grading. So yeah, there could be additional detail, and it's up to uh, the designers. All right, so we have that. What's another main process involved inside our system? Here's their completed work. Uh, oh, where does the grade go? We better have another data store of, should we call it our transcripts, our report card? How about transcripts? We may break that into multiple, you know, with a specific courses. But I'll just call it transcript for now. If we can come up with a better name, let's see, I gotta change my font color. And so when they get a grade, when they have a signed grade, that gets stored in the transcript, and we'll just call it grades. And that gets stored into the, in the transcript data store. So grade, final grade, grade. I suppose grades is good enough. And I can move around my data stores. And Visio handles adjusting my connection. And maybe I'll put that over here. Keeping it on the same size and things is just a way to try to keep some sense of organization. And what happened to my title? Didn't I have a title on this line? Completed work. Uh, what would I call that? Uh, results. or final version results I guess I'll go with that and a little bigger to see so we have our grading process what else does our system do somehow we need courses and content in the courses we have to provide the course material How would you, what would you call that? It's kind of like what 
eLearn is doing for us. But can you give a name to that? That's that's the tough part. What should we call the process of course content? Well, that would be a noun, but deliver course. How about course delivery? I like that. And let me see if that's two course delivery, where it has coursework, and I can choose different sizes of things there. I'll make my title big and the number small, and I can adjust my box size, realizing it. Oh, look at that. It shows me when I'm the exact same size as something else. I like that. It's the same height as that one. Now it's the same width. Course delivery. Well, this data line probably would go there. So course design and assessments. Uh, well, assessments we've already put here, assigned grade. So we'll take this and we'll call this, we'll let, relabel this. Uh, course design. And so the instructor enters information about the course, puts materials into the course, syllabus, and the instructor gets back from it. I guess he can view the course. He, he can get a report about the course. He can get a roster. How about that? We have the instructor sees the roster of students. Okay, if I drag it to one, is it going to be the end or the beginning of the arrow? What do you think? Oh. So we'll call this one uh, roster. And in the course delivery, part of that will be um, a data store of course materials. That's a nice generic term. Test banks, quizzes. So we'll just have a data store of course material. course content that's more generic how about call it course content I'm gonna have to make my font black and call it course content and having dug through how uh, eLearn works I kind of have an idea of the parts that make sense. And the course delivery reads the course content and then provides the web page. A very typical way of a database driven or website has the content stored in a database. The actual presentation is also the CSS style sheets stored in the database but we can uh, wrap that up in the term course content. And now connect that to course delivery reads the content to present it to instructors and students. It stores the content as the instructor adds assignments and things. So data is almost the same thing. You're, you're delivering content and you're updating content. We'll call this uh, displayed displayed content, and maybe we'll call the other connector updated content. It tells the data store update this information. I could call the data I could call the data on that line updates plural.
maybe if I could move that over and not have them hop on each other. I think I can, can I adjust the position of that text box? I think there's a way. I thought I saw a way to adjust my location of the text. No, on these I see something at the corner. Do I have to double click it, maybe? No. Oh, there. Okay. I see what you're saying. Got it. I was wanting to adjust the position of text on the line. I see little dots there in the middle of the displayed word, but I don't see anything to do except adjust it left and right. But I'm happy to adjust it left and right. Okay, so delivery of the course, is there more data involved than displayed and updates? I'm going to narrow my data stores a little bit. I'm like wasting a lot of space here. Reads the content from the database. Instructor can send updates to the content. The student views the content, but if I drew that arrow, it would be crossing all sorts of things over here. So I think I'm going to leave out delivering the course to the student data flow to save me crossing line. And I, I, I would bet I, if I were doing this, maybe I could write one and just say, by the way, student reads the data out of the process without drawing the whole line all the way across there. But we'll leave it at that. We'll assume that's part of it. So we grade, provide some kind of grading process, course delivery process. How about, is there another process involved here? Transcript, content. We haven't got anything to do with billing. What do we keep track of for billing? Let's, cr let's create a data table of, well, do we need more than that? We have their transcript. What does accounting need from us? Is there a separate data store that I need to worry about? Or can accounting take the information we have in these data stores? We get their transcript which would include their names and what work they've done, right? And what courses they're involved in. So the transcript data store may have all I need for reporting to the accounting system. <coughs> so let's just make this uh, billing. Should we call it a billing process? What should we call it? Financial status report. Billing report. Yeah. OK, so that'll be process three. Billing. How about billing report? We're going to send billing reports to accounting. We will put a put a freeze on their grade report if they if there's a billing problem. So this might work. So billing report gets data from the transcript. And it tells the accounting system. So we'll say, what should we say? Uh, what's the data? Very, very generic at this one, isn't it? Student status. How about that? Student status. Can I move that position? I thought I saw, some, saw, saw somewhere where I could adjust the position of the text on the... No, that wants to move the whole thing. I can adjust my corner at some point, I thought. I can adjust him up and down. 
I can adjust him left and right. Maybe that's my only adjustment. I can attempt to adjust him up and down, and then he pulls it away from my connected. I want to be sure I stay connected. So student status, I suppose that's good enough. Make sure he's still connected. And the billing report we send off to accounting. And I guess status, status is good enough for now. If I find more details of what the accounting wants to know, I might specify that specific information. But status, accounting provides to us a request. So they're going to ask for a student name and our system will provide the status of that student. So how about we ask for student profile. Or just student name. How about just student name? They provide the student name, we give them the status of that student name. Actually, you better change that to user because they want to check on the payment to a teacher as well. So let's put in user. Username, that could be a teacher or a student. We provide, if it's a student, their transcript. If it's a teacher, Yeah, we need like a user table, don't we? Oh yeah, we can better go. Sorry, I wasn't watching the clock. Yeah, we'll stop there. Uh, now, since we need to create level ones, pick one of these and break it into smaller pieces. I think the course delivery might be an easy one. Think of you know different pages in the data store, showing different pages: the login page, the course page. Grading process, it needs to upload assignments and assign grades to that. So probably one and two might be the easiest ones to give a detailed blow up of those. Let's see. I haven't even saved it yet. I better make sure I lose it. And we'll end.